For it seems now more certain than ever that the bloody experience of Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. But it is increasingly clear to this reporter that the only rational way out then will be to negotiate, not as victors, but as an honorable people who lived up to their pledge to defend democracy and did the best they could. I shall not seek, and I will not accept, the nomination of my party for another term as your president. I don't want to live in a country where news media figureheads have the power to determine the beginning and end of an American presidency. That's a decision for voters. That's a decision for elected officials. That's not a decision for activist journalists. When Walter Cronkite decided that the war was over and basically told the American people as much in his broadcast, that really had an impact in, on policy here in Washington, D.C. I believe that was a defining moment for the state of American journalism. Walter Cronkite was the most watched uh, news person uh, we call them today news readers, but the most, most, most watched of all of those at that time and had personally tremendous influence with the viewing audience. When the media turned against you, if you were a major politician, that was just about it. Uh, when Johnson said, well, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost middle America. I mean, there was, there was really a trust ingrained uh, in the American people with the media. And I believe that people like Walter Cronkite really are, were at the forefront of breaking that trust. When an incumbent president announces that they won't be seeking re-election, not because of poll numbers, not because of policy, but because they've lost the most influential man in America, and that influential man is a leader in the media, that shows how powerful, how great the hold was that the media had over the American public. And that's the way it is. It's dangerous. You know, in those days, uh, in order to actually run for president, uh, a candidate or a prospective candidate had to, had to actually go to a series of dinners uh, in Washington with people like Cronkite, like Scotty Reston, and, and the giants of the media in those days. And if they thought the person maybe should be capable of being a candidate, they'd start to mention him. If they decided that you shouldn't be running for president, you might as well not run because you'd, you'd flunk that early, that early media primary and weren't gonna get much coverage. I literally grew up watching the Vietnam War on TV every night. Uh, those of us that uh, wanted any news coverage, we had to tune in to people like uh, uh, Walter Cronkite and Eric Severide and, and these uh, major news networks. The media, consciously or unconsciously, conspired with those who wanted us out of Vietnam to make that a reality. The Vietnam War came alive in our living rooms with the most horrific of, of coverage, telling us that, uh, first of all, the troops were corrupt and, uh, you know, they were on drugs and uh, that we were just killing people willy-nilly over there. It was a complete distortion of what was happening in Vietnam. I believe it was the Tet Offensive which inspired Walter Cronkite to sort of give up on the Vietnam War. That was the beginning of the end of our uh, commitment to defend South Vietnam. The reporting on the Tet Offensive was uh, certainly in retrospect one of the most biased things that went on. Uh, the media was uh, causing Americans to, to think one way about the war which was not actually comport with reality on the ground. Uh, including that we did not lose the Tet Offensive, we, we won, <laughs> but in the media's eyes, that was the beginning of the end. On the ground, uh, it was a failure on the part of the communists in Vietnam. In the United States, it was a great victory because of all the action. It looked uh, like they were winning, and it turned the public against the Vietnam War in ways that it hadn't been before. That kind of reporting had a real impact on the way the country reacted to world events and the way that we, uh, we dealt with foreign policy. Because if you're going to be involved actively uh, in something like the Vietnam War, you better hope the public is behind you. The fact that Walter Cronkite had that power, again, that comes back to the fact that the, in that age, the media were basically CBS, NBC, and ABC, and Walter Cronkite being the most prominent. You couldn't uh, watch him and then tune into Fox or tune into another network and find somebody disagreeing you found people echoing what he had said. There was no 
other alternative voices are very few. Those guys had all the power. There wasn't this huge alternate media network. There wasn't Fox News. You had, uh, you know, National Review, which was uh, uh, William F. Buckley's publication. You had Human Events, which was the conservative weekly, and and uh, people like Tom Winter and, and Stan Evans holding uh, forth over there. And then you had uh, the AIM report. It was really Reed Irvine and the organization of accuracy and media that began to wake up conservatives to the fact not only that they had to contend with this bias on a day-to-day -day basis, but that maybe, just maybe, they could do something about it.